Whether people like to say it or not, I was bigger than College Station. It didn't take me very long to be in Cleveland to find out that I wasn't going to be happy there. I had every single thing that I could have ever wanted. You have money, you have fame, you're a first-round draft pick, battling for a starting quarterback position. And when I got everything that I wanted, I think I was the most empty that I've ever felt inside. Watch this last night. In addition to watching the blind side after the Astros game was done, had the Rangers game on in the background to see them lose. Now the Astros just two and a half games back of Texas in the AL West. Gotta say, considering how excited I was for this documentary, Sean, I think you're on the same page as me. We kind of knew everything in the documentary already. Yeah, there's like three revelations, or they're not even revelations. They're just like stories that yeah, the, his agent tells or that uh, his high school friend tells that are like surprise or not even surprising. Uh, they're actually the least surprising stories. They're just like ones you didn't know. But yeah, there was uh, uh, this is one where it felt like it could have been like an hour and a half or two hours. They, they, it felt like they're pretty strict on the 60 minutes uh, like ti- time limit. Yes. And this one really considering they spent more time talking about like how much money Texas A&M was making going to the SEC and having Johnny Manziel. They, they talk more about that than his botched suicide attempt. Right. It's crazy. Completely <laughs> glossed over. Late in the movie, after you see essentially a about a 10-minute montage of all the things that he's doing to sabotage himself, they would show like internet headlines and videos of him like essentially walking away from... TMZ. And TMZ, stuff, yeah. right. Then there's a moment where he says... That he was going to blow his brains out. He shot the gun and the gun clicked. And it's just completely glossed over compared to the rest of it. I I, I think this is something that could have easily been two episodes, three episodes, one hour each, or something like that. Yes, because they I this is because I, I watched it last weekend uh while on vacation, and then I watched it again last night to like, you know, just refresh myself. I I was shocked both times how early we get to the Alabama game. <laughs> yeah. And how how quickly they go through the Alabama game. Very. And then the the his second year at AM, they hardly talk about it at all. They, Barely see he it. He gives like a throwaway mention about like, yeah, you know, I wasn't working out as much because I knew I was going pro. There's no reason that team should have gone eight and four. And then that's it. <laughs> this should have been a three part series. His beginnings, year one, year two. And episode two and after. with some hints about what's happening in the fall. They didn't highlight any of those specific stories about things that were happening to him as his he was self-sabotaging his own life. Also, just a little gripe as someone who watched those Texas A&M teams. They gave no mention to the fact that there's like four other uh, first round picks on offense. Like Mike Evans. Mike Evans, uh, Matthews. They had another. Uh, oh, I forgot. I think he actually played for the Seahawks. They had another. Um, I think I know who you're talking about, too. Yes. Yeah, that that team was loaded. And honestly, I I can go back and find the tweets. I remember specifically saying, because this was right before the 2014 NFL draft. This is when I first had a radio show. And first couple of months on the job, the daily conversation was, should the Texans think about taking Johnny Manziel? And I remember saying to myself, look, or saying on the the radio to my co-host, Brian Straw, I was like, look, Mike Evans is the reason he won the Heisman. I'd argue Mike Evans should have won the Heisman. And it's not to say that Manziel is going to be a bad pro, but I don't want to take Manziel first overall. Yeah. I I don't want to take him first overall. Yeah, but the words Mike Evans were never said in this documentary. Not once. Not once. You see him when they show him at at midfield. Yeah, at the, like, Hall of Fame ceremony. But no mention at all. And Evans was so effing good for the Aggies. He's He's, he's had a great NFL career, too. he's going to be a Hall of Famer. Probably, yes. You're right. So... I was frustrated with how they, they, they really move through things very, very yeah. quickly. This is this is almost like film critique. So if you want to watch it, you can. Um, there were a couple of takeaways that I, I had from it. Um, one, when we talk about the label bust, it's for guys like Manziel. It's for guys who not only didn't put in the effort, they clearly didn't care that they put in no effort. And multiple times it's brought up. He studied no film. He's showing up to games hungover, which does add to his legend at the college level. But, and, and I understand this idea of it stopped being fun when it turned into a job. Like, I get it. But if we're looking at players 
who are busts in the NFL, the guys who don't care, who don't try, Jamarcus Russell, Manziel, like these are busts. I, I think that's a word you should throw at people that didn't even try. Because some guys, wrong situation, maybe not as good as we all thought they were. I, I think we should be a little more cautious with that term. But Manziel is definitely one. Yeah, his dad uh, nailed the hit the nail on the head when he said, "Like, yeah, it felt like, you know, Johnny Manziel. Johnny realized that he had eight uh, eight point five million dollars coming guaranteed, so he just stopped caring." And yes. like, yeah, that's ex- exactly what it seems. One hundred percent. So, so that's that's the first takeaway is that like guys like Manziel, they are the real busts. Number two, it seems like it wasn't that impossible that Manziel could have been. At one point, the Texans' first overall pick or potentially a late first-round pick until this pretty hilarious story. Would the Houston Texans pick Johnny Manziel first? Houston, number one pick. The buzz is building in the city. All around the Houston area, billboards are up to bring Johnny football back to Texas. We got involved with a big charity foundation event. The owner was going to be there with his wife. Johnny ends up like donating his own money to the cause. It goes phenomenal. The next day, I get a call. He was golfing today at River Oaks Country Club, and it got back to the owner's family, basically, that Johnny, by hole five, had taken his shirt off, looked intoxicated, and broke multiple clubs over his knee and threw him in the pond. There goes Houston. Who hasn't done that? Oh, he can't draft Johnny Manziel now because he did that while golfing? Come on. You know, four... Four drinks in? Yeah, come on, Bob McNair. Yeah, L- lighten up a little bit. Uh, one thing, one of, one of my favorite takeaways, and you also have it in the notes, <laughs> when they're first signing autographs in Miami and they go down, they they have one autograph uh, client, I guess, who's screwing them over. So then they go to the second one, and the second one, to prove that he's legit, calls Alex Rodriguez, and Alex Rodriguez just goes, yep, he's legit. And Johnny Manziel and his friend Nate are like, all right, we're good. That's all. I think the Nate literally says, that's all we needed to hear, was Alex Rodriguez. <laughs> Vouch for a guy. Have you ever met hustlers like that in real life? Yes. They're the worst. <laughs> Absolutely. It's like, it's just ab- they're always going to just try to big D it at every moment they can. I, I will say, though, I... Another kind of small criticism. This is a very small criticism of the of the uh, doc. They never really say why Nate just never talked to Johnny Manziel ever again. Glad after, you brought that up. After so in in college, Nate was basically his like illegal agent. Consigliere. Yeah, he was he was the one setting up all the autograph signings and stuff, and all all the business dealings that again should not have been allowed under the NSA rules at the time. He handled it. Then when he went pro, he got a legitimate agent who, like, actually reps NFL players. And so he told, like, Nate, he was like, yeah, you know, we're going to kind of move away from you having day-to-day. And then just the next voiceover from Johnny Manziel was like, and I never talked to (laughs) Nate ever again. Thank you for bringing that up, because that's where we were going to. It's indefensible. This, This guy seems like he was an incredibly loyal, not just person helping you out. This was his best friend. And Manziel just iced him out. And I get maybe you feel the need to do it because you want to make NFL teams comfortable with you. But I remember when I first heard about Uncle Nate, I thought, this guy, complete weasel. I I watched this documentary. As a texter points out, how can you believe anything that Manziel says? It's a great point. Yeah. He is the the definition of Eddie Haskell. But with, with Uncle Nate, I actually did believe everything Uncle Nate said. Yeah, because Uncle Nate has no reason to, like, when you None. find out that he he doesn't talk to Johnny Manziel anymore, like, there's no reason for him to lie. And it felt like there were no sour feelings towards Manziel. That, that's the crazy part, In spite part, of too. all of it. And this and Manziel just ditched him. It's, it's ultimate backstabbing. I mean, this idea that Uncle Nate had so that Manziel could make tons of cash signing autographs such a great idea. is genius. You know, Nate was very okay with being the fall guy. And with that, me and Nate split everything 80-20. The next step is, how are you going to explain why you are wearing Rolexes and driving new cars and flying in private jets? As a freshman, you weren't allowed to talk to the media. 
but they were allowed to talk to me. And so the biggest spin still exists today. I invented the narrative that his family was vastly wealthy. Yeah, I've been blessed with family members and have had these opportunities and I've always been able to do this. We sold a little bit of a dream that my family had more money um, than they actually did. It's truly a brilliant idea. Such a great idea. And Manziel just threw him to the curb. And again, this is his best friend. And I, I, I think all in all, the Manziel experience was an incredible couple of years, specifically here. Like this was some of my first years on the job. The first time I ever went to Kyle Field was the first game between AM and Florida in the SEC. I'm on the sideline, Lee Corso's to my left, Chris Fowler, who was so nice to my right. It was such an awesome experience. And I remember watching it because I'm a Gator fan, thinking to myself, who the hell is this guy? He's like kind of good, even though he's tiny. He's surprisingly mobile. He didn't play great in that game, but I thought, oh, okay. Didn't think he would turn into this. Like I, I, I was there for the first game. And the amount of times that we talked about this guy for a two-year stretch was truly incredible to the point where we were wondering, are the Texans going to take him? It was such an incredible run, but the guy sucks. He just sucks. And I mean, if he was ever truthful, I would love to see it. I didn't really feel like there was remorse or that even much regret there. The, the, Sort of like, yeah, I mean, I just played, I had fun, and, and here I am now. And I'm like, oh, man, like, I, I would beat myself up every day. And to that texter's point, like, I'm not even sure that I bought that story that he told, like, the, about about the suicide. I, I I don't know. The doc starts and ends with him hanging out with his friends in Scottsdale, smoking and <laughs> and drinking beers. And then several times through the movie, he's like, I had a, I had a drug and alcohol problem I had to get a hold of. <laughs> and it's like, wait, but... <laughs> When we zoom back to current day, it doesn't Pop really. Beer. Yeah, he's like, I, you know, I loved. I think at the end he was literally saying like, I love the frat boy kind of life, and I, I couldn't give it up. I, that's what like derailed my uh, NFL career. As he's saying that, the B roll, the like video that's playing is him and his friends playing darts in his patio. Yeah, like, like it seems like he knows the right things to say. Like he's been coached of like what the right thing to say to sound contrite is, but then like he doesn't actually go through with it. He doesn't follow through with it. It's essentially exactly as you laid out. And I, it makes you mad. It makes you mad a little bit. You wonder what you would do in his shoes, I think, more than anything. Would you be able to handle it? Honestly, I don't think I would have been able to handle it. I, I, I feel like as somebody who has always been chasing fame, if I were to suddenly get it, I think I would be just as empty as he felt once he moved to the NFL. I, I honestly do feel that. And also, if I got all this money and all this attention, I, I feel like I would turn into an absolute disaster. I start to coast a little bit. Definitely when I was like 19 and 20, it would I would have done things exactly the exactly. same thing. That, because that's why, you know, Johnny Manziel is like three years older than me. And so my viewpoint of Johnny Manziel in high school, when he was in uh, at A&M, balling out i was like this guy is the freaking best <laughs> this yeah. guy is awesome it's exactly how you like you want to live your life at that uh moment in your life and now you realize like actually uh super bad <laughs> super bad i guess he's trying to open a club up in northgate or something like that too yeah that, I, I heard oh, that too i love the northgate bar scene love it am i being sarcastic or not you don't even know 